I am Chris Wetterland, Director of Education and Interpretation here at the museum, and it's my privilege to welcome you this evening. I wanted to take just a moment to tell you about some new exhibits that are opening this spring and this summer. Uh, a pair of exhibits honoring women in light of this year's anniversary of the passage of the 19th Amendment. A mini exhibit on Corel in our Innovations Gallery. And our major exhibit this year in Sparkling Company, Glass and Social Life in Britain during the 1700s. An exhibit that looks at what it took to be modern in the 1700s and what it cost. And you still have the opportunity to enjoy Journey to the Moon in our Innovations Gallery until the end of April. And also a uh, new Glass Now context in the Reykjavik Research Library until the end of the year. That exhibit looks at uh, the history of New Glass and its publication, as well as uh, former exhibits. It's a wonderful uh, exhibit, and if you haven't seen it, I, I really encourage you to get over there before January. And I'm standing here with Richard Whiteley, who is going to introduce our guest, but I want to introduce Richard. He is the senior program manager at the studio, and if he looks new to you, it's because he's just joined us, our team from Australia. And I know you're going to love to get to know him as much as I have. So I'm going to turn it over to Richard. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Tonight, we've invited Mark to talk about his experience in the year-long residency program at Corning Incorporated. The Specialty Glass Residency offers unique access to Corning's research team and facilities and is co-managed by Corning Incorporated and the museum. The program is highly selective and is offered to one artist per year. It provides an extraordinary opportunity for the artists as well as the, research, the researchers to collaborate and share knowledge. Throughout his residency, Mark has been assisted by Jake Chamberlain, who's with us this evening. Mark has worked with um, Jake has worked with Mark for over 20 years and has made a considerable contribution to Mark's time here. Around Mark and Jake have been a team of scientists, researchers and material specialists that is part of the extraordinary research culture at Corning. We thank them all for their commitment to um, Mark's work and the ongoing residency program and many of them are with us this evening. Before I invite Mark to the stage, I'd like to say a little about his extraordinary career. Firstly, 50 years and counting. That's how long Mark Pizer has been working with glass. Half a century of continuous research, pioneering and production. Commitment to any material for that long requires drive and determination. But Mark's perseverance with this mercurial, mysterious and downright truculent material of glass demonstrates a focus that is exceptional. Mark is an innovator and one of the founding voices of the studio glass movement. He emerged into this nascent material in 1967 after leaving an industrial design position and he has maintained a steadfast commitment to his artistic practice ever since. When Mark began working with material, there was very limited information on how to process glass at a studio level. There was no internet, there were no YouTube videos, and no centres like this where you could um, come and study workshops. There existed only a handful of people trying to work glass within a studio context around the globe. So Mark read, tested, and spoke to whomever he could to develop the knowledge needed to realize his ideas. Within his work, he has never been static. He has consistently developed and adapted his practice in response to new ideas. He started with blown glass and moved to casting when the material properties suggested conceptual ideas that drew his attention. That move necessitated a complete retooling of his studio and led to him embark embarking on new aesthetic processes and technical methods to advance his work. Some of the ideas guiding his work were around atmosphere and attempting to capture a particular quality of light within the body of glass and wrap this around specific forms. One of the forms that Mark has been drawn to for nearly 20 years now was not a work of art, but this museum's very large and heavily flawed 
200 inch telescope mirror in the innovations hall right next to this lecture theater. The crack and def defective object cast here in 1934 inspired Mark with its unique and unexpected color, a cloudy haze that reminds Mark of the mist in the Appalachian Mountains. Another element of inspiration was the sheer scale of the catastrophe that was the mirror's making. Its failure offered Mark, and I must say a few of us, a sobering reminder that even a collection of the best technical minds can struggle with this material, particularly at scale. But Mark was also equally inspired by the mirror's successful sibling, the Palomar mirror lens that is still in operation in California and cast here starting in late 1934, annealed for, for almost a year. And in this room, at this podium in 2014, Mark noted that this successful mirror had been hand ground for 11 years, thus making it the most handcrafted piece of glass in existence. Mark has had an extensive and highly successful career over the past five decades. He was inducted to the College of Fellows of the American Crafts Council in 1988. He received the Lifetime Achievement Award from the Art Alliance for Contemporary Glass in 2000, uh, 2004 and the Lifetime Achievement Award from the Glass Art Society in 2010. I should add an organization that he co-founded in 1971 to help artist to artist dissemination of material uh, information. His work is held in many private and public collections around the world, including just a few here, the Museum of Art and Design in New York, the Peggy Guggenheim Collection in Venice, the Smithsonian American Art Collection, the Tokyo Museum of Art, and of course, this beloved museum here. Would you please join me in welcoming Mark Pizer to the stage. <laughs> Well, thank you, Richard. I think you said it all. Uh, uh, thank you all for coming. Have <laughs> a good drive home. Um, um, well, um, okay. Uh, what I'm going to give you tonight is a, uh, well, it's the wrap up of my specialty glass residency. And, um, I hope that uh, most of you at least recognize my title as a reference to Tolkien's The Hobbit and specifically to Bilbo Baggins' book of lifelong travels and epic adventures, There and Back Again. Now I've expanded that a bit. In my title, the There is my studio in North Carolina mountains. I've had my own private glass studio for the last 53 years. Much of my practice has been to run tests and experiments to learn about glass and its properties and what they might allow or encourage me to do with them. This mostly trial and error approach has taught me a bunch as well as teaching a master class in failure and disappointment. And when I say we, it's me and Jake Chamberlain. Jake and I have worked together on all sorts of things for 20 years. Perhaps you've seen us walking uh, through the museum or down the corridors or in the cafe at Sullivan Park. Incidentally, I'm really going to miss the Rice Krispie treats. We, we, <laughs> We just don't have them down there. <laughs> Jake is a superb craftsman. Before coming to work with me, he did fine work, woodworking and marquetry inlay, and was accustomed, accustomed to a careful, disciplined approach towards a defined end. Not exactly the way it works in my studio. One morning, about a month after working in my with me in the shop, he came in and said, I figured out what you need to know to work here. Prepare 
to fail. <laughs> the here in my title, of course, is Sullivan Park and the Museum of Glass. The program provided us with several short introductory visits and four one-week work periods over the last year. Our adventures were perhaps not as epic as Bilbo's, but there were some moments. And our traveling wasn't as arduous as crossing Middle Earth on barefoot as we got to go forth and back from Charlotte on the Corning Shuttle, <laughs> which will forever make me despise commercial air travel <laughs> even more than I did before. I think I am somewhat different than my predecessors in this program. Here's a bit of my background. In 1967, through a series of coincidences, I took a three-week glass blowing class at Penland School in North Carolina and was offered a residency at the school, which gave me access to the school's glass studio, pictured here, and whatever resources I could find around in the other of the school's studios, the metal studios, enameling, jewelry, lapidary, ceramics, and so forth, in exchange for improving anything on the school's grounds. My first issue was the temperature of the annealers was controlled by how big a brick was used to hold the door open. I fixed that for $10. <laughs> Soon, I discovered I was part of the recently born studio glass movement. Then, I discovered the movement didn't know much about blowing glass, <laughs> the necessary equipment, or glass itself. Penland School in the 60s was a humble place. It offered classes only during the summer months there were no resident instructors, and those that, no resident instructors, just those that came to teach their two or three week summer classes. During the rest of the year, there were only like five people living on the mountain, and none of them knew anything about glass, and I didn't know anyone who did. In high school, I was the math science guy that played piano. I started college in electrical engineering, finished it in industrial design. I worked professionally in design and engineering departments. And living in Chicago, I was accustomed to having information available all the time. When I asked my glass instructors in 1967 where the information was, they told me that technical information was all proprietary, so don't even bother to ask. Well, I did, and I got very few answers. The literature suggested that might have been due to the Venetian death squads <laughs> lethally censoring the secrets of glass blowing. And part of it was due to the added industry's attitude that small melts and furnaces just couldn't work. So I figured that figuring all that out was part of my job description. So at the beginning of the studio glass movement for convenience and availability, it adopted the Johns Mansville 475 fiberglass marbles as its glass to work with. I didn't have to know much about blowing to believe it wasn't the best choice. So, in 1968, I began to teach myself glass chemistry. And all my work after 1968 has been made only with my formulations. That's the crystals, colors, opaques, and opals. I thought that was part of the job description, too. By the time the resources were commercially developed and available, I had developed the knowledge and ability to formulate families of glasses that were specifically created to facil facilitate my bodies of work, so I've continued to work that way. 
Actually, the seed of much of my work, work has been the glass itself. For instance, in 2007, I began a series of pieces that were done as a tribute to Corning's casting, the failed first casting of the Palomar Mirror in 1934. The series also had another goal, though, to investigate the visual possibilities of pale translucent tra phosphate opal glasses. Uh, in 2014, I gave a behind the glass lecture here that tells more about my involvement with opal glasses and it's on YouTube if you want to check it out. Here are some of the pieces from that series. When this piece was cast, this is what I expected to see. Well, that was after four years of trials and failures and erratic results, but we hoped to see it. Then, this piece is cast of the same glass and had a quite different and unexpected result. It takes some explaining. First, the colors you see are not the result of pigmentation or colorants in the glass, but are the product of light scattering of some sort analogous to what happens in our sky. When the sun, as you probably know, is overhead and the light's path to us is shorter through the atmosphere, we perceive blue. At sunset, the light's path is longer and more scattered through the air, and the color shifts towards red. The same physics is happening in this piece. When this glass is thinnest, it appears blue, and where thickest, it approaches red. The two pieces are cast with the same glass. The difference is the result of how the glass was cooled. Controlling that in real life required research and engineering and luck to come even close to being controllable. Meanwhile, the other side of my brain was realizing different parts of a glass casting could appear different colors depending on its thickness. In other words, the form would determine the coloration. And I'm wondering, what's that good for? That wasn't just some sort of decorative glitter. And then, if it interacts with light as the sky does, what would you do with it? Could you make a sky? I've done that before, but not with a material that treats light in this analogous way. Full disclosure, the sky has been a recurring subject in my work since I began with glass. I guess it's been prompted by the transparency of the medium, but I've never been a fan of water clear glass, colorless glass, and I've long sought ways to give visual substance to transparency. Here's a brief rundown of some representations of the sky through different bodies of work, which you are still seeing. Much of my work for the last 53 years has been suggested, indeed inspired by the glass itself. Sometimes a quirk or property of a glass prompts a vision that leads me in a new direction, like I've just described. Okay, back to the opal thing. By 2016, there was a growing awareness that the opal glass I developed in the early 2000s was perhaps not the best for this process. 
We spent nearly six years and managed to finish 15 pieces. Finding a glass that was more controllable eventually became the main focus of our residency here, though initially developing a new glass was outside the guidelines of the program, which fortunately seemed to change. I'll return to this thread after telling you about some of the other directions that we pursued during our residency. When we first came to Sullivan Park, I had some ideas for work based on glasses I suspected might be in Sullivan Park's files. There were five different ideas we investigated, which I will now relate. The first we call the index glass slump. One of the ideas involved transparent glasses of differing indexes of refraction. It could be said that the refractory index is the measure of the bending of a light ray when passing from one medium to another. In transparent mediums, this interface is visible. For example, the outline of an ice cube in a glass of water is clearly visible and yet completely transparent. What I saw was fusing frits and chunks of selected sizes into a solid form, yielding a visually transparent texture, yet optically obscured mass. The interfaces of glasses with significantly different indexes can appear, can appear silvery and somewhat mirror-like. It seemed by selecting frits and proper sizes and distribution, an index dispersed through a matrix, and perhaps if it was stretched or was allowed to flow a bit or was distorted by tooling, you might get something looking like a school of minnows, perhaps darting in a new direction. Well, there were some naysayers at Sullivan Park thinking that to fuse them, the boundaries would intermingle and lose definition. In the studio world, I've seen where this may not be significant. Our experience at Sullivan Park is that the conception of normal temperatures for melting are around 3,000 degrees Fahrenheit. In the studio world of casting, the temperatures are about half of that, in the neighborhood of 1,500 to 1,700 degrees Fahrenheit. We did make some attempts. Perhaps I overthought it. Having seen many fused frit pieces, inevitably a multitude of tiny bubbles are trapped in the casting. For what I envisioned, these would be visual noise. So we tried to do the fusing in a vacuum furnace, hoping to release and eliminate them. Well, I'd never seen a vacuum furnace before. However, we did have a misconception of how the available vacuum furnace worked. Let's just say we didn't ruin the furnace, but <laughs> we never did get the desired result. We ran five tests that resulted in something resembling frog eggs in the mud. <laughs> so our next adventure was stiffed by the Anderson effect. Meanwhile, we'd seen an example of the Anderson localization effect a formulation that when hot and stretched, something very unusual happens. Unfortunately, it doesn't photograph well, and the best I can describe it is, if you've ever pulled taffy, it's like that, where you have the impression of fine parallel strands being developed, only it's white and silvery seen from the side. However, from the end, it's quite transparent. Well, the stretching of the samples we saw occurred when the glass was delivered from an overhead melter. 
it appeared to have some of the visual properties of the index glass we'd been seeking. Jake asked, though, could it be blown? Well, we tooled up for that, or rather got Bill Gudenrath from the, uh, the studio to go for the honors. It was a heroic effort, <laughs> but this glass required more heat to form than provided by all the torches we could find in Sullivan Park. We never really managed to get it hot enough to even really gather. But the results Bill generated demonstrated the effect could be captured in the blowing process and were quite unique and quite special. My guess is if the studio borosilicate workers don't have something like it yet, they will soon. We did take some of it to the studio and got Emilio Santorini, Santorini, damn it, Santorini to try flame working it, which did work easily for him, and it did make some small vessel forms and retain that Anderson effect. And then next there was the tooth glass debacle. On our tour of labs, we saw this outside David McEnroe's office, especially the piece on your right. <laughs> left, left, yeah, there you go. Okay, Jake and I both had the thought, <laughs> thank you, Susie, <laughs> that this definitely evoked the sky. You know, though I thought that it might be something like the last thing Amelia Earhart ever saw. <laughs> we were told that it was a glass developed for prosthetic teeth. It loses its initial transparency when reheated. In this test piece, it was reheated only from the outside edges and withdrawn before the heat reached the center, leaving the more transparent passage through it. Well, we thought if we could make a mask of insulating board or something and applied it to the cold transparent glass and then reheated it, we might be able to create cloud-like patterns in the sky. We tried some schemes to do this with some success, but there were problems with the annealing. After four cracked castings, Dr. Stephen DiMartino proclaimed the ceramic struck phase, ex, uh, phase expansion was significantly different from the matrix glass, so it wasn't really a good idea for a piece that employs both phases. So we moved on, wondering if lasers work, but do they belong in a glass shop? Also, on an early tour of the labs, we visited one where they had an incredible laser device that was being used to cut the multiple faces for cell phones from large sheets of glass. We were told some details of the machine's capabilities. Now, I don't know how many times I've said so far that I'm looking for fog or mist or haze, but it's a property that I've wanted to work with for a very long time. When I first saw the Larry Bell piece, now in the museum's collection, I wanted to move my sound system and chair inside it for a month. For me, it evokes the comforting warm mist of the mountains. If you haven't seen that piece, I suggest you take a look. The sensation is created in that piece, which is about an eight-foot cube, by a carefully designed translucent shell of plastic that diffuses light by appropriate amounts. It's a simple idea, but not so easy to pull off. So I asked the laser guys 
how fine a line can you etch? And how close together can they make them? And can you make us five of them so we can make a box? And they did, and it worked. It created a little environment, a space of its own within. It was really like smoke in a box, but it was only about four inches square on a side. We asked, can you make the panels bigger? They said we could if we made some changes to their million dollar machine, <laughs> like screw a larger table and so forth onto it. We said, yeah, we can do that. <laughs> and they thought a bit, and that's where the project ended. <laughs> and then next there was the mystery glass heartbreaker. In another lab, we saw a hazy, hazy erbium pink cube about an inch and a half on a side that had the appearance of a wisp of white smoke in a hazy pink matrix. The haze is what got our attention. Again, if you have seen the Larry Bell piece in the museum collection, this is something like a tiny representation of it. We inquired about it, which eventually led us to talking with scientist Jesse Cole. Actually, it seemed no one accurately knew why the haze was there, but suspected the rare, the rare earth material had something to do with it. Jesse took an interest and began running tests. Now, I need to say that since the early 70s, I've been rather obsessed with the visual properties of opal glasses. How many times have I said that tonight? Especially how to limit them to something like smoke in a box. In 2000, when that tells us more about that, yeah, 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 yeah. But I suspect that my living in the North Carolina mountains for the, for the last 53 years, with its range of fogs, mists, clouds, dews, and the haze of the Blue Ridge Mountains has much to do with it. These things do set my mood. As John Constable, the famed English landscape painter, said of landscape art, the sky was, quote, the keynote, the standard of scale, and the chief organ of sentiment. Our phosphate opal, like all the other opals I have worked with after being tested, is a liquid crystal phase separation, meaning there are microscopic crystals that scatter the light within a transparent glass matrix. Whereas Jesse's glass turns out to be a liquid-liquid phase separation, meaning there are tiny droplets of a liquid glass I hope no one from Sullivan Park is here. Liquid glass suspended in a transparent glass matrix. I don't know, but I suspect that may be responsible for what we perceive as an obvious visual difference. Here is a pic showing the colors of light being scattered in Jesse's glass. This bool is three and three quarter inches in diameter. You can see that in perhaps, well, four or five inches, there would be a red color developed. In our, red, in our glass, red would appear in maybe nine inches, but at that distance, the light is almost all filtered out. The impression I get from this glass is hard to describe. It's more transparent, if you can say that about an opal. It just seems brighter. If it were sound, it would be more like flutes than oboes. Jake and I were both excited to see what this glass would do in a piece. As I mentioned before, the opacity of a cast striking or phase separated glass is dependent on the composition and how and how long it is cooled. And that depends on a number of things like how hot the glass is, how hot the mold is, the thermal conductivity, how hot the oven is, and other variables. 
In my experience, the only way to achieve a desired outcome is by multiple tests of the whole process. So I designed a rather simple piece to be used as a test. It was based on a current series called Passages, typically a portal of some sort through the sky or a rainbow or whatever. Proportions were developed with a styrofoam mold. What I envisioned was a stairway path leading up to a window of blue sky surrounded by a spectrum darkening to red at the edge of the disk which is about 15 and a half inches in diameter and five and a half inches thick at the rim. The casting would weigh about 50 pounds. We then had a graphite mold made. The good thing about graphite molds is that they are reusable and they can take high temperatures. The bad news about graphite molds is they are good conductors of heat and cool parts cast in them quickly. Jesse had identified how to precisely regulate the opacity of the original formula as seen in these tests, but some guesses as to where to start with the formula. Uh, we made some guesses as to where to start with some formula and proceeded to cast a piece. Well, <laughs> well, the first thing we, we actually learned was it's really hot under that furnace. Um, but the first thing we, were, we really did learn was that the glass, this glass, which is a very unusual formulation, even though at nearly 3,000 degrees, had such a short working life, it wouldn't flow evenly to fill the mold. We had anticipated filling the mold would be a problem and designed it to be rotated while being filled. But the glass was so short, it had set up by the time it made a revolution and fresh glass was poured over it, left, and it left creases in the casting. Also, there were cracks in the cooled casting. Also, the opacity was too strong, but that would be an easy fix once the casting process was worked out. Jesse reformulated the glass to pour at a lower temperature, like 2270 Fahrenheit, again with regulated opacity options. It cast better, but presented a new annealing problem. With diminishing optimism, we managed seven more castings with incremental changes to the mold and temperatures and procedures, but never got beyond the, big, the annealing issue 
before our time at the residency ran out. There was an increasing belief that the biggest problem was the graphite mold. Down there in North Carolina, Jake and I have developed vermiculite molds that, more that are more insulative and have other advantages for casting opals, but they are not reusable. So we never got a piece made during our residency. The good news is Corning is going to release the glass that Jesse developed to the studio world. I believe with the utilization of, of other mold materials, stunning results are possible. Later this year, I'm planning to test to try lowering the temperatures even further and increase the workability. No doubt there will be frustration and failure in that effort as well, but it might succeed. I'm almost done now. <laughs> but first, I want to show some of the opal pieces from my Passage series and at A2 Deblo series that I hope demonstrate the character of these glasses and why I've sought to use them. In conclusion, I hope I didn't give the impression of resentment or anger at the ignorance of the early studio movement. I feel, though in retrospect, quite the contrary, as it led me to experience glass as a personal relationship. I feel fortunate that began when glass was perceived with the come hither seductiveness of a blank slate. Fortunate, it was a time when the material itself had the mystery and aura of a living thing. Fortunate, it was a time you could feel the rush of discovery almost daily, even when you knew it was a, dis a rediscovery of a hundred or a thousand years ago, a time when what wasn't understood was best accepted as magic. Glass isn't so mysterious to me now. I've gotten to know it, not completely, of course, but pretty well. It's been like living with anyone for a long time. You learn to recognize their looks and moods, their needs and wants, likes and dislikes, their inclination to ideas, their willingness to accommodate. And you learn the accommodations you yourself must make to continue. My various bodies of work represent an evolution of that relationship, one always striving towards a particular state of collaboration, one in which both Glass and I have a voice. In doing so, I've hoped to be an advocate for the material. And finally, I'd like to thank the Corning Museum and Sullivan Park for this extraordinary opportunity to interact with so many informed and giving people. And special thanks to Michelle Wallen, Michael Preston, and Jesse Cole, who always came through for us. Jake and I are somewhat bummed we never got a piece to show for everyone's efforts. But if there's anything Glass has taught me over the years, it's delayed gratification. <laughs> Seems the people we've met here are also familiar with that notion. And I think we can all agree that the answer is just X number of tests away. So thanks again to Corning. And thank you all for coming tonight. And oh, thank you. Thank you. Well, any questions? You want to do questions? Yeah. So we have uh, a few minutes for questions yeah. and we have some
two very overqualified uh, people on the microphone here. So ah. if you put up your hand and um, uh, one, of our, uh, one of our microphones will make its way to you and um, mm -hmm. Mark can take a few questions from the audience. I'm not seeing any hands. Ah, oh, come on. Certainly. We should have planted some questions with Michelle. We should have. <laughs> well. I just think most of us are basically stunned because <laughs> your work is so beautiful. Thank you. Um, so I just want to understand the color variation is because of the relative thickness of the glass in these pieces? That's correct. Okay. It's so where it's thinner, it's blue, and where it's thicker, it's warmer in color. Well, it's, yeah, basically that's true. Yeah. It, it, it's, it was essentially a happy accident in that one piece from the Polymer series that I showed that, you know, just uh, actually didn't even notice it till you know some months after the piece was finished or after it was finished that that was what was happening and um and there were though you probably wouldn't have noticed it in the in the image but actually the the real polymer disc that was cast the the the, the bottom of all those wells is actually on a curb a curved surface which was duplicated in, in our piece. But there is a slight gradation from the blue into sort of a yellow green. You know, the, the, though it was just a very, you know, it's only a, maybe a half an inch at most. But that kind of is what sort of set me off on this. And it, and it really is, uh, it's 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 just it's such a I, I won't go into what we the successes that we've had I'll put it that way uh, that's me and Jake you know in the end we spend typically we cast the pieces at six o'clock in the afternoon and we follow the coop we put the piece in a annealing oven of course. And we follow the temperature of it every 15 minutes. We take a reading on it. We actually seal the mold that the glass is in. We, have, uh, we take temperature readings within the mold and within our oven and try and control how it's cooling. And we have found at least uh, well, let me put it this way. I hesitate to say we know what's going to work, but the last two pieces we made, we did the same thing, and the glass did the same thing, too. And we thought, that's good. I think, I think you know, that's, that, that, that's you know, good enough for us. But, but it really is that way, and I do, and I do believe, I'm one of those things that got me so excited about the glass that Jesse developed, you know, over the last... I don't know, six months, is that, um, first of all, it's, it's just a, a very um, extraordinarily unusual formula. And, and he has, um, has figured out how to precisely melt, melt it in very, very precisely graduated degrees of opacity. So we're kind of going on the idea that if we can overcome, well, and like I said, it seems like it's the graphite molds that we're really, the, we feel pretty confident if we poured it into our vermiculite molds, it, it, we wouldn't have had those issues. But, um, but, but we, we really feel like that glass has great potential to be, you know, more controllable. Okay, a follow-up question to that. I'm glad I came a second. Um, from inception and going through the different mold processes, what was the period of time until you got to the two that matched each other? Jay? Yeah. 
maybe 10 years. No, yeah, Did everybody easily, hear that? Easily, yeah, it was actually probably more. Um, okay, it's a decade. There you go. No, it, 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 yeah, yeah. In popular culture in the 20th century, there's been this vast gulf developed between art on the one hand and science on the other, which was not in human history traditionally true. And your work seems to speak to a great unity between cutting edge science on the one hand and great aesthetics on the other. But I wonder how you as the practitioner see that. The, um, the, the kind of relationship between art and science, that sort of thing? Well, I, I, I don't see any difference. You know, I'm basically, that's, that's the way I look at it. I think, I did find, uh, I, I think during, during this residency, um, well, let me put that another way. Like I said, I started off life, you know, expecting, everyone expected I was going to be some sort of engineering science guy. Um, you know, it seemed right for me until I ran into some issues with electrical engineering. And, and you know, and then I moved into design and, and um, um, but I, you know, I, I mean, I, I've always considered, you know, um, I mean, I'm sorry, I, I, I walk around the, 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 the campus, whatever you call it, here at Corning, and I'm just constantly looking at the details of construction, and they're beautiful. They're just beautiful. They're executed beautifully and conceived that way. And that, to me, is beautiful, you know? I see, I, I appreciate that sort of thing. Um, and and um, I, I just don't, I, I kind of don't see a distinction, you know? I mean, I think create, though I did, I guess I was starting to say, I did, uh, when we got here, I did, maybe after I, maybe I've been in the, whatever, I hesitate to call it the art world, but, but that world for, for so long, that um, when I got here, I, I did sort of sense a difference in the kinds of creativity, if that's, you know, feasible, you know, between, you know, the people I was talking with at Sullivan Park and, or how they approached a question than perhaps I would, but um, but I, you know, I mean, I, I, I can look at formulas and think they're beautiful, you know, and I can look at, you know, whatever, yeah. We have probably time for one more question. I, I have a question regarding um, size that you work with, because there's a lot of obvious trial and error and and manipulation and what what is your what is your size that you start with as your objective and then work off from there because you have some you know do you start real small and then end up with a really large piece is you know some because just like a painter does their work mm. and and practices to get to where they're going to create something well, do you have a favorite place that you start well unfortunately it, it, it um, since I got into this, um, you know, kind of, uh, whatever, obsession with trying to do these phase-separated glasses and create, you know, some kind of colors, you know, delineation of something. Um, it, it, it only works, you know, at a certain scale. Um, I mean, it, it turns out that in our glasses, you know, that usually means, you know, that the, probably the maximum thickness should be about six 
inches, six and a half inches, or else it just um, filters out too much light to be, you know. And, and again, with the amount of mass of the piece, um, you know, affects the cooling, the, you know, rate and, and so forth. So it, it seems like, uh, you know, it, it just doesn't really read, you know, small. We, we've done a few things that we've seen, but it doesn't happen. So they're all kind of major efforts, you know, even like, even, I mean, we, we do consider, you know, a 150 pound piece a test, you know, even if it takes us three months to actually see what, what it was. But it's, you know, sometimes you win, sometimes you don't. But, but, um, but yeah, the, the mo it, it just turned out that they are all pretty, well, for glass things, you know, kind of in the 100, you know, 150 pound range. Thank you, That's everyone. It? Um, okay. Thank you, Mark. Oh, you're welcome. We get to